Good evening. Welcome to California Today. I'm Ling Zhang. Here is a preview of some of today's stories. California could be short on more money than originally anticipated. The budget deficit may see an additional $7 billion. In one Bay Area county, the eviction moratorium is still in effect. Landlords protested to end it sooner, but the Board of Supervisors will let it expire as originally planned. The California Attorney General opened a civil rights investigation into the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, one of the largest law enforcement agencies in Southern California. But the county sheriff slammed the investigation as a political stunt based on activists' quote, false and misleading statements. As revenues continue to fall, California's budget deficit may be $7 billion more than what the governor forecasted in January. The legislative analyst's office estimates low revenues and operating shortfalls over the next few years. The legislative analyst's office says state revenue may be about $10 billion lower than expected, which could raise the deficit to over $29 billion. The office says many factors have contributed to the revenue drop. Rising inflation spurred by federal pandemic stimulus money, Federal Reserve interest rate increases, and a cooling economy have all played a part. The office said revenue from personal income taxes and corporate taxes also declined. However, with the revenues dropping, state spending remains at historic levels. Governor Newsom has proposed to delay certain investments and reduce spending in water and drought programs and reduce climate initiatives by $6 billion in the next fiscal year. He also proposed that cuts in some housing programs, health care workforce investments, transportation, and other spending. The gloomy financial picture comes just a year after the state's coffers overflowed with an extra $98 billion from federal pandemic stimulus and surplus funds. Blizzard warnings continue in California. Heavy snow has covered the mountains over the last few days. The back-to-back -back winter storms have left some residents in Southern California housebound since last week. In El Dorado County, people were walking through knee-deep snow and many residents in the San Bernardino Mountains are still stuck in their houses with snow piling as high as their windows. Parts of Interstate 80 were shut down. Officers were responding to stuck motorists all day Tuesday, and snow up to 15 feet deep covered parts of Yosemite National Park. Officials have closed the park with no estimated date for reopening. The National Weather Service, or NWS, issued blizzard and winter storm warnings for portions of Washington, Oregon, and California. According to a map posted Tuesday by the NWS, mountains in southern Oregon and California may see heavy snow rates of two to three inches per hour. The Sierra Nevada and Southern California may see an additional two to four feet of snow. Blizzard conditions will make for dangerous to impossible travel. Meanwhile, one of the most significant snowfall events of the season hit the northeast portion of the United States. Most flights had to be canceled or delayed in the northeast. Hundreds of schools across southern New England either closed for the day or delayed opening. Forecasters say the storm will eventually spread across the United States and bring snow and ice into the Midwest and East Coast later this week. Bill Thomas, NTD News, California. More property owners protested in Alameda County to end the eviction moratorium. This comes as the state's COVID-19 state of emergency expires and the Board of Supervisors decides on their next steps. Outside the Alameda County Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, property owners call for an end to the eviction moratorium. Some say they have been traumatized by the experiences they have had to deal with for so long. I am a single mom of two children and I've owned my home for 12 years. In October of 2019, I um, asked another single mother to come and live in my home in a room in my house so we could live in community for below market rent. Um, as 
the time went on, it turned into a rather toxic situation, and I asked her to leave, and she refused. After three years of this, um, I decided that I couldn't handle it anymore, and I left with my two children fleeing our house because it was so toxic of an environment. Um, she also hasn't paid rent since July of uh, 2021 and owes more than $15,000. I have one tenant currently and another tenant who stopped paying rent during the eviction moratorium. I am here because the time period they were still there was really traumatic and difficult and stressful. Um, I am one of the lucky ones where that person did eventually move out. I am owed thousands of dollars and I was told by lawyers, um, pretty much anybody I talked to, I couldn't do anything, which was really unsettling. All this for the tenants is their problem. They need to find some, some kind of resolution, not put it on the landlords. We don't, we're not their responsibility. All we're doing is supplying a service. And we're about to lose all of that. Then where they're going? Then everybody's going to be homeless. It's not fair. I think everything should be on a case-by-case -case basis. They point out that while it's important to look out for the tenants, the landlords need to be considered, too. It is important to house tenants and it is also important to house the owners of homes and neither one of those people should have more power. We should be working together to create solutions that work for everyone. There's circumstances that are unsafe, that people need to be compensated, people who aren't doing the right thing need to, you know, if somebody's doing illegal activity in your home, you should be able to have them leave um, if they're not paying rent and they can't justify it. There's no reason that they should be allowed to stay. We're not their parents. The board will let the moratorium expire at the end of April, as originally planned. And George Wu, who has been on a hunger strike since Sunday, officially ended his protest on Tuesday. The California Attorney General is launching an investigation into the sheriff's office in Riverside County. It's one of the largest law enforcement agencies in Southern California. Attorney General Rob Bonta announced his office opened a civil rights investigation into the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. The February 23rd announcement comes after deaths in county jails hit a two-decade high last year and other allegations of excessive use of force surfaced. Our investigation will seek to determine whether the Sheriff's Office has engaged in a pattern or practice of unconstitutional or unlawful policing. This investigation comes amid deeply concerning allegations relating to conditions of confinement in the office's jail facilities, excessive force, and other misconduct. These concerns have been repeatedly voiced by community leaders, members of the media, families of those who have lost loved ones, and more. He did not give specific examples or specific incidents that prompted the civil rights investigation, but his office will investigate in the days and months ahead. The Riverside County Sheriff, Chad Bianco, responded in a video statement calling the investigation a political stunt. This investigation is based on nothing but false and misleading statements and straight out lies from activists, including their attorneys. This will prove to be a complete waste of time and resources. Had the Attorney General or anyone else from DOJ reached out with questions or concerns, we could have provided more than enough evidence to prove these allegations false. He failed to do that. Instead, he chose to make a sensationalistic political statement appeasing activists while implying the Riverside County Sheriff's Office has done something wrong. Bianco continued saying they have nothing to hide and will cooperate with the investigation. The Attorney General has the power to open civil investigations to determine whether a law enforcement agency has violated state or federal law. These cases are meant to identify potential problems and then work with the agency to correct the issues. The state agency has similar cases open into the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Those probes are ongoing. We are going to take a short break, but here's a look at what we got for you when we come back. Lawmakers proposed an amendment to the health care system, including expanding the definition of gravely disabled. They want earlier care for those with a severe mental health. 
Most California prisoners are required to work while serving their sentence. A new law would change that. And Southern California got to see cultural horse dancing. It's a half millennium old Spanish tradition. That and more on California Today. Welcome back to California Today. I'm your host, Ling Zhang. State Senator Susan Eggman announced new laws to overhaul California's behavioral health care system. Senate Bill 363 would establish a real-time dashboard on bed availability in facilities. And SB 43 seeks to update the state's conservatorship law. Senator Susan Eggman, elected officials and advocates are pushing to remove those with mental health issues off the streets and into care earlier. The point is not to detain people against their will. The, the point is to get people help much earlier on. And this will hopefully just deal with a, a smaller subset of the population who struggles with mental health issues. They're hoping to do this by changing the mental health system. One of the changes they're proposing is through Senate Bill 43 which expands the definition of gravely disabled to include a condition that will result in serious harm to a person. Uh, and we see this in countless communities throughout the state. Every city is experiencing this, that we have this cycle of devastation, of human devastation on the streets, of people who we all know need help and literally cannot get it. The lawmakers say the decades-old legislation on conservatorship is obsolete pointing to examples of homeless individuals with mental health issues. In the 1970s, California legislators wrote the LPS Act, named after legislators Lanterman, Petrus, and Short. It provides for the involuntary commitment or conservatorship of a person who is a danger to themselves or others gravely disabled. Our paramedics, our firefighters, our police officers, we in the city of San Diego spend over 400 service hours every day responding to behavioral health emergencies. They also want to give psychiatrists or clinical social workers more authority when it comes to conservatorship and treating patients. These uh, collective of Senate bills that will help to change the definition so that, for example, that same clinician who diagnosed James could just provide a written detailed report that could be used to make a decision about whether or not someone like him should be conserved. SB 43 was first introduced at the end of last year, and SB 363 was introduced last month. Both bills are now making their way through the state legislature. David Lamb, NTD News, California. State lawmakers recently introduced another new bill that will allow children to receive mental health services without parental consent. Many critics of the bill are saying it's undermining a parent's right to know. On February 13th, Democratic Assemblywoman Wendy Carrillo introduced Assembly Bill 655. The bill would allow children ages 12 and older to consent to mental health services without parental permission. Currently, the state allows minors over 12 to consent to such if they are, quote, mature enough to participate intelligently and if the child is in an abusive situation or danger of harm to themselves or others. The new bill would remove the conditions of abuse or potential harm. It would also require mental health professionals to receive the minor's okay to speak with their parents or guardians about the child's treatment. According to the bill's text, it aims to make access to mental health for youth easier, as some parents or guardians may hold stigmas about such and not seek it for their children. It says, quote, Providers, particularly school-based providers, find that obtaining parental consent for a youth who needs support is complicated by the parent or caretaker's beliefs and stigma about mental health care. The bill also states that LGBT youth may experience higher rates of depression and anxiety due to rejection from parents and harassment at school. But many critics of the bill say it may undermine parents' right to know what their children are experiencing in school. Brenda Lepsack, a teacher and former Orange County School Board member, told the Epic Times, quote, parents should not be shut out of their children's lives. 
The state has previously ruled for less parent or caretaker communication regarding minor children on other issues. And under a 2018 state law, foster care youth over 12 can consent to receive transgender hormone replacement therapy or sex change operations. The bill is expected to be heard in committee in March. Some lawmakers are pushing to ban involuntary servitude in California prisons. Prisoners can get credits for their work, but some advocates compare it to slavery. Most California prisoners are required to work while serving their time, but several lawmakers and advocates are pushing to prohibit forced prison labor in the state. On February 17th, Assemblymember Lori Wilson and several others introduced an amendment to California's Constitution to remove the clause regarding criminal punishment. In a rally, Wilson and advocates pushing for the amendment say that involuntary prison labor is similar to slavery. The allowance of slavery in our prisons disproportionately impacts black people. Those of a community still impacted by the aftermath of slavery in our country. Under the California Constitution, slavery is prohibited. Involuntary servitude is also prohibited, except to punish crime. The state's Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation give people credits off their prison sentence for their work assignments. Participants can earn $0.08 cents per hour up to $20.44, depending on the job and required skill level. If the proposal receives two-thirds support, it could go on the November 2024 ballot for California voters to vote on. In a similar move, voters in the states of Alabama, Oregon, Tennessee, and Vermont approved ballot measures that could curtail the use of prison labor back in November 2022. A Spanish tradition of horse dancing came to Los Angeles over the weekend. One lucky participant also got the opportunity to walk away with their own Spanish purebred horse. City of Industry held an event on February 25th to celebrate a 500-year-old Spanish tradition. Even rain could not stop over 700 Spanish horses from dancing on the Feria del Caballo at the Industry Hills Expo Center. Spectators dancing horses and their owners came to display the horses' dance skills. The horse owners explained the tradition. Since I've been a little kid, I've always, uh, my father had um, ca um, horses and cattle, but I, I wasn't able to fulfill this dream until two years ago. I bought ho my horse and I bought a ranch. You don't want to dance them too much on concrete. You want to dance them like on dirt or you want to dance them on like soft sand so they don't get hurt. It's never easy. Nothing is easy. It's all, it's all patience, training and experience over the years. This horse show competition was limited to purebred Spanish horses only, and the judges based their scoring on each horse's movement and appearance. And, and it's more than just dancing, it's a competition. Once you get into it, it, it has a lot of points that uh, they all add up, and it's, it's a lot into it, it's very nice. The horse stands on a platform and dances to music. A winner is chosen at the end of the show. Attendees came out to enjoy the spectacle of watching a horse dance and prance around to music. Mexican bandas provided live entertainment. Oh, it's amazing. It's a lot of nice culture and traditions from uh, my ancestors. So it's really beautiful. And then I get to pass it down to my daughter. You know, Hispanics are always, we always unite together, especially when you got horses and banda, you know, it's always a good time. Despite the rain, attendees still enjoy the music and show. So far, so good, even despite the weather, because it's so cold and rainy. But um, we would come back again. The show is held four times a year at the same location, with the next one being held on May 4th to the 7th. This weekend's winner was Elizabeth and her new horse, Caracol. Now let's check in with the NTD's Tyler Castile for today's Sports Roundup. I'm Tyler Castillo, taking you through the California Today Sports Roundup. 
Ja Morant had 39 points as part of a triple-double, and host Memphis took advantage of LeBron James' absence to pull away from Los Angeles. The Lakers, who led by as many as six points in the third period, saw a three-game winning streak and shortly after learning that James is expected to miss at least two weeks with a foot injury. Grizzlies 121, Lakers 109. Harrison Barnes scored 29 points to lead Sacramento and its winning streak to four games with a victory over Oklahoma City. Demonte Sabonis had 22 points, 13 rebounds, and 9 assists for Sacramento after beating Oklahoma City for the second time in three days. Oklahoma City, which lost its fourth straight, battled back from a 17-point deficit to tie the game at 98. Barnes scored 8 points during a 12-2 run to help Sacramento regain control. Davion Mitchell, who started in place of injured point guard De'Aaron Fox, sealed the victory with 4 points in the final minute. Kings 123, Thunder 117. Jordan Poole and Klay Thompson combined for 24 points in a third quarter flurry that rallied Golden State from a huge deficit and into a victory over Portland and San Francisco. Poole finished with a game-high 29 points and Thompson 23 for the Warriors, who welcomed back Draymond Green from a knee injury and won a third straight game. Warriors 123, Trailblazers 105. Jaden McDaniel scored 20 points and Anthony Edwards added 18 as visiting Minnesota ended a three-game losing streak with a victory over Los Angeles. Rudy Gobert scored 16 points as the Timberwolves won during the second game of a four-game visit to California. Paul George scored 25 points and Kawhi Leonard added 23 as the Clippers lost their third consecutive game. Timberwolves 108, Clippers 101. Jake Allen made 37 saves for visiting Montreal in a win against San Jose. Jacob McDonald scored his first goal of the season for the Sharks, who have lost 6 of 7 and Capo Kakinen made 29 saves. Canadians 3, Sharks 1. Anze Kopitar recorded his second career four-goal game, and Los Angeles rallied from three two-goal deficits to hand host Winnipeg another loss. Los Angeles was down 5-3 after two periods when Kopitar scored on a slapper in the third. Kings tied it when Gabriel Villar defeat Connor Hellebuck. Adrian Kempe had the lone goal in the shootout for Los Angeles. Kings 6, Jets 5. And that's the sports roundup for today. That's all we've got for you tonight. We would like you to join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. Make sure to check out our broadcasts on our California Today webpage. You can find it at ntd.com slash California dash today. You can also find all of our top latest clips there, ready to share with friends and family. Send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or through our email, california.today at ntd.com. I'm Lang Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.